Hello there. Welcome to the Potter's Wheel. I'm George Osmus. I'm one of the owners of Potter's Wheel Films, and I'll be your host for the next half hour. If any one film genre marked the 1980s, it was the action movie. These films made the careers of guys like Schwarzenegger, Stallone, Ford, Willis, and so many others. While maybe not artistic masterpieces, they all followed familiar storylines and always went over big at the box office. There were certain things you could always count on, like bulletproof heroes, henchmen who couldn't shoot straight, and helpless victims being tormented by a megalomaniac villain. Nobody watched these movies to learn physics or achieve some sort of spiritual or philosophical enlightenment. These films are escapist entertainment and rarely pretended to be anything else. They're built on hard punches, automatic weapons fire, and gigantic explosions. Among the long list of common denominators in the action film genre is the montage that shows the main character getting prepared for battle. Now what does that have to do with the Church of Jesus Christ? Well, we'll talk about that on today's episode of The Potter's Wheel. The prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah compared the people of God to clay and spoke of the Lord as a master potter. On its own, clay has no form, no purpose, but in the hands of the master, it can be shaped into a design of his choosing to serve his purpose. He has a number of tools to help him in his work. Chief among them is the potter's wheel. If you've spent any time in the book of Proverbs at all, you'd know it's filled with sound bite sized sayings covering the full spectrum of life's issues. Proverbs reminds its readers twice that a prudent man foresees evil and hides himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. Some other translations even say it a little clearer. For example, the easy to read version says, Wise people see trouble coming and get out of its way, but fools go straight to it and suffer for it. The bottom line is that there is wisdom in preparing for life's challenges. Solomon pointed to the ant to enlighten his readers on the wisdom of diligence and planning ahead. Go to the ant, you sluggard, consider her ways and be wise, which, having no captain, overseer, or ruler, provides her supplies in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. So, wise men, prepare. And nobody with any sense, not even the most die-hard action hero, thinks they can charge into a situation with biceps bulging and guns blazing and hope to come out on top. All the best action heroes always take the time to prepare themselves before they go into battle. Here's a little montage I compiled to help illustrate the point. Jesus admonished his followers, Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Now being ready for the second coming is certainly important. No one is saying otherwise. But I do suggest that the second coming is but one application of the command to be ready. So the questions you might be asking are, What else should the church be ready for? And how do we prepare? 
I want to do things a little backward today because I want to talk a little bit about how to prepare first. We live in a spiritual war zone, saints. Maybe we don't feel the heat of the battle as much as our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world, but that doesn't mean the enemy's attacks are any less dangerous or deadly to our spiritual life. The Bible is clear that we have an enemy who walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Paul acknowledged the spiritual war and instructed the church at Ephesus in their preparation. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. He went on to describe the spiritual armor of God, including the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, and the sword of the Spirit, among others. These elements of the armor are our best preparation for the trials, temptations, and struggles of this life. Now, I don't want to spend a lot of time on the armor because there are so many great teachings on it out there, but here are just a few quick thoughts for you to chew on. In a natural suit of armor, the breastplate protects the heart and other major organs. Righteous living has the same effect in the spirit. Sin gives the enemy access to our heart, so learning to resist the temptation to sin and live in a way pleasing to God guards our heart. We can sidestep and bypass so much pain and so many problems in this life simply by obeying God's moral commands. Don't ask me how I know. In a natural suit of armor, the helmet protects the brain. In the armor of God, the helmet of salvation protects our thinking processes. Being saved, born again, and filled with the Spirit of God gives us a mind renewed to the kingdom of God and changes the way we think about life. When one encounters God and genuinely becomes a new creation, we begin to change what we think about. Our minds are renewed to the Word of God. We eventually find that what we used to love, we now hate, and what we used to hate, we now love. This is because the helmet of salvation is now covering our thought life and turning us toward God. The only offensive part of the armor of God is the sword of the Spirit. Now, I can't overstate the importance of reading, knowing, and applying the Word of God to the life of every disciple. Learn it. Know it. Live it. The Word is how we know right from wrong. It makes God's will known so we don't have to be confused. Jesus showed us how to use the Word of God as a weapon against the temptations of the enemy in His wilderness trial. He showed us how to stand on the truth of God's Word to counter the lies of the enemy. It's really true, saints, that if we will submit to God and resist the devil, he will flee from us. We don't have to live in defeat. If we will learn to use the sword of the Spirit properly, we can be confident of victory over the enemy every time he attacks. We know that we are to live in expectation of the return of the Messiah, we are told to watch and stay vigilant and prepared because no one knows the day or the hour, despite what some misguided souls might want you to believe. We have to be ready, church. There won't be time to get ready. But as I said earlier, that's just one facet, one aspect of Christian living. And there are other things for which we need to be prepared. So let's talk about some of them. Be prepared. First, every disciple of Christ needs to be prepared to share the gospel. Peter said that we should always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. Times of trial and trouble and confusion and calamity are a dime a dozen on this fallen world. But when the lost see that you can go through the storms of life and stay in a peace that they themselves have never known, that's going to get their attention they're going to have questions. They're going to want to know how you are keeping your head while all around you are losing theirs. You will need to be prepared to tell them all about Jesus, the work he did on the cross, and the promise of the empty tomb. I believe there are essentially two types of people to whom we will need to give those answers. There will be hostile unbelievers and genuine seekers. 
And while it is true that we are not to cast our pearls before swine, it's also true that many of the most outspoken Christians in our modern times started out as hostile believers. Lee Strobel, the author of The Case for Christ, started out as an atheist trying to disprove the Bible and wound up being converted instead. The late Chuck Colson, founder of Prison Fellowship, started out as Nixon's hatchet man during the Watergate scandal, but found redemption in Jesus Christ while serving his prison sentence. Examples abound down through the history of the church. So don't give up on anybody and uh, be careful about judging things before their time. Amen. Peter quoted from the prophet Joel in his sermon on the day of Pentecost, telling those assembled, and it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Paul expanded on the idea in his letter to the Romans, saying, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? You see, church, it's the rank and file believers that are supposed to be the soul winners, not the fivefold ministry. Ephesians 4 tells us pretty clearly that the fivefold ministry gifts are given to train and equip the saints, that's the church, the body of Christ, you and me, to do the work of ministry, or to put it another way, to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now let's think about this a minute, church. Whatever this work of ministry is, it requires the cooperative efforts of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers in order to train and equip the rank and file to do it. Now, how much training do you need to wash dishes in a soup kitchen? How much education in the ways of the kingdom do you need to jockey a cash register at the church thrift store? No, the work of ministry Paul is talking about here, I'm sure of it, is preaching the gospel to the lost out there in the streets. So, if the preaching of the gospel is supposed to take place outside the church, in the grocery stores, in the hair salons, in the restaurants, and everywhere else where the Lord leads, then doesn't it follow that our services are to be for the church to get instructed in the principles of the kingdom, trained in righteousness, equipped for every good work, and, most importantly, filled with the Spirit of God? Have we missed the point of the Sunday service, you guys? If we're going to be the church that Jesus built, maybe we need to undergo a time of demolition first. Hmm, <laughs> that might be a topic for another show. One final point on this topic before moving on. Jesus' public ministry was all about calling people out of sin and to himself so that he could save them from hell. He talked about it often and said it in many different ways, but without a doubt, the most succinct version is when he told Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This wasn't just a one-off statement, an off-the-cuff remark that John happened to record for posterity. No, this was the main thrust of his entire mission, to be the Lamb of God who would save man from the penalty of their sins. He's the only one who could do it. How dare we call ourselves by his name, proclaim to be his followers, then publicly contradict him on anything? How dare we claim forgiveness without repenting of our sin? How dare we call him a liar by saying, Saying there are many ways to God. How dare we disobey Him by indulging and satisfying ourselves instead of denying ourselves, take up the cross, and following Him. Check yourself before you wreck yourself. Next, we should always be prepared to be a blessing. Be prepared. When God called Abram out of his comfort zone, part of the promise God made to him was, I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. Thousands of years later, Paul confirmed the Abrahamic covering over the church, saying that those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. If Abraham was blessed to be a blessing, so are we. I know I've said it before, and I'm not going to stop saying it until it stops being true, we're not here just to consume the blessings of God on our flesh. We're here to be a blessing to the world around us. Jesus said, the poor you have with you always, and whenever you wish, you may do them good. Opportunities to be a blessing are all around us, church, if we would just get our eyes off ourselves long enough to see it. 
It's kind of baffling how ministries that are trying to serve the poor, feed the hungry, and clothe the naked are struggling to save three cents in a length of pipe, all while the body of Christ is trying to figure out how to live its best life now. I live in a town of about 40,000 people. Now, if everyone would give just $1 a month to the local soup kitchen, that's an income of $40,000 a month, which translates to nearly half a million dollars a year. Who's going hungry then? Maybe we need to examine our priorities. What do you think? We're going to pause for a few words from Potter's Will Films, then we'll be back to continue talking about ways we can be prepared. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. So what do you suppose a thousand pictures would be worth? At Potter's Will Films, we want to help you find out. We're a Christian film company. We make movies and TV shows that preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, teach biblical life principles, and encourage other believers in their faith walk. We're also here to help Christian churches, ministries, performing artists, and others with their digital media needs. We're ready to take on any size project, from a 30-second teaser spot to a 30-minute TV show and beyond. We want to use our tools and talent to help you expand your audience and increase your impact in the community. Contact us at 217-494-7798 or by email at potterswillfilms at gmail.com and let us open the world of digital video media to you. Potter's Wheel Films is proud to announce that our SC shop is now open for business. We're offering an ever-increasing line of Potter's Wheel Films merchandise and a gospel-centered clothing line. Proceeds from the sales will go toward funding current and future projects for Potter's Wheel Films. I believe God has some big plans for Potter's Wheel Films in the days to come. You can be part of it by shopping our store at Etsy.com. Also, don't forget to like and follow us on Facebook and YouTube so you don't miss out on any of the excitement as we step out into the future God has for us. God bless. Welcome back. God said, and Jesus affirmed, that His house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. Prayer needs to be a central part of any believer's life. If it's not part of yours, I tell you, in love, you are missing a major part of the call of God on your life. Again, we are surrounded with opportunities and targets for our prayer life. I've talked a lot about prayer on other programs, but here's a short production from Potter's Wheel Films that outlines a prayer strategy the Lord gave me several years ago. Church, we are at war. A war whose battlefield is the prayer closet. The Bible tells us that Jesus' disciples asked him to teach them how to pray. Now, if these men, who walked with him daily for three years, asked this of him, how much more should we be asking it today? I believe the Lord has given me a prayer strategy based on the seven mountains of culture teaching. To review, those mountains are religion and faith, family, education, government and law, media, news and commentary, arts and entertainment, business and economics. The strategy is pretty simple. There are seven days in a week, so just pray for a different mountain every day. But make sure you are following the leading of the Lord. He might have you keep it local for a while, just praying for your city, or he might have you pray over these mountains on a national or even global level. I believe there are basically two kinds of prayer, defense and offense, just like in a natural war. Defensive prayer focuses on the person's spiritual, emotional, or physical needs. Offensive prayer focuses on driving out the demonic forces with whom Paul said we wrestle. Again, be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit and follow any unction you get from Him. My wife and I have been following this strategy for several years now. Here are some broad brush petitions that we pray over each of the seven mountains. We pray that his spirit would break the influence of hell, that God would remove the ungodly and the wicked from their places of power and influence, that the Lord would raise up righteous men and women of godly character to take their place, and that he would strengthen his people with the might of his spirit in their inner man. 
Remember, we are to be led by the Spirit of God, acknowledging Him in all of our ways, not on our own understanding. I would encourage you to be as specific or as general as the Spirit leads, but don't pray against specific people unless you have a strong unction from the Lord to do so. Our judgments are fallible. His aren't. It's best to let Him do the judging. Can we agree on that? I would also encourage you to be extravagant when in praying blessings over people or organizations. Above all, pray in faith and believe that we have those things we ask. The time has come to fight back against the principalities and powers, the rulers of the darkness of this age, and against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. The complacency and apathy of previous church generations has led us to this place in our culture. But if we will turn from our wicked ways and pray and seek his face, I know that he will hear from heaven and heal our land in Jesus' name. My wife and I still follow that pattern years later. The important thing with any kind of program or plan, however, is to hold on to it loosely. Remember, the whole idea behind a fervent, effective prayer life is that it be empowered and inspired by the Holy Spirit, not by our own carnal thoughts and flawed perceptions. We get into religion when our plan becomes more important than hearing and following the leading of the Lord. And that's never a place the disciple of Christ wants to end up. Be prepared. Finally, we need to always be prepared to lay down our lives for the gospel. Sometimes that's figurative language, meaning that we're laying down our ambitions and dreams in order to pursue God's call on our life. But in this case, I'm talking about literally being prepared to die rather than deny Jesus. I dedicated a previous episode to the idea that martyrdom has always been a part of the call to follow Christ. If you missed it, it's season two, episode three on our YouTube channel. You might want to go check it out. Jesus said, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. There's no shortage of people who have put their lives on the line for the kingdom of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, we have Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. You probably know them better by their Babylonian names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We know what happened to them. Samson laid down his life against the Philistines, and David faced down Goliath, both defending the name of the Lord. No one knows exactly how many prophets of the Lord were massacred by Jezebel, but we do know that Elijah was next on her hit list. Fortunately, the Lord stepped in and put an end to her wickedness. In the New Testament, we have John the Baptist, who was beheaded because he called Herod out on his sexual immorality. In the book of Acts, both Stephen and the Apostle James gave the last full measure of devotion to the cause of Christ, becoming the first martyrs for the gospel. In his letter to the church at Pergamos, Jesus recognized Antipas as a faithful martyr. As we all know, most of the original 12 apostles became martyrs. The trail stretches from the dawn of history to our modern times, and it's going to continue until the Lord returns. Jesus promised, therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. We want to be on the right side of that promise. Can I get a witness? Time is almost up, so just a couple of final words of encouragement before we close in prayer. It's true that we must always be ready, for we do not know when the Lord will return. It's also true that we also never know when the opportunity to be the church will come. May none of us, myself included, miss it when it comes. Let's close in prayer. Jesus, we thank you for laying down your life and offering up your precious blood to remove our sin from us and making us righteous in the, sight, in the sight of God. We know, Lord, that it is because of your death, burial, and resurrection that we can come boldly before the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And Father, we do come today in the name of your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to present ourselves as living sacrifices, to lay down our lives upon your altar, and to offer our time, our tools, our talents, our treasures, to build your kingdom. Thank you, Father, for the wisdom and instruction in your word to 
Look ahead, expect danger, and plan accordingly. Grant each of us wisdom to prepare ourselves for the dangers in our path as we follow you and walk the path you have for us. Speak to our hearts and guide us to whatever preparations we need to make. Give each of us ears to hear what you would have us do. Let us not be led by a spirit of fear or selfish ambition, but by your spirit, O Lord. Give us eyes to see opportunities to be your church, I pray. Give us ears to hear the Spirit saying, this is the way, walk ye in it, and a heart that obeys your command without hesitation. By your Spirit, Lord, overcome the unholy trinity of doubt, fear, and unbelief, that we might be the church that overcomes the gates of hell as you designed and desired us to be. Father, I plead the blood of Jesus over the seeds that were planted during our program today. I pray for each of the viewers that the Spirit would find good ground in their hearts for the good seed of your word. I pray that it be received with meekness upon good soil, and I claim your promise of a harvest over it for their lives, that you might be glorified in and through the lives of your people. In Jesus' name, God bless. All your life, there has been a God in heaven who loves you and wants an intimate, personal relationship with you. Sin made that impossible, but he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to remove that barrier and offer eternal life to whosoever will believe on his name. If you've never done so before, I encourage you to say yes to God today. Admit that you're a sinner. Believe that Jesus of Nazareth is the Son of God. Believe that he died on the cross for your sins and that he was raised from the dead on the third day. Commit to follow Jesus for the rest of your life. Now, tell someone about your decision because the Bible says, with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. If you did that from a sincere heart, welcome to the family of God. You have taken the first step of a journey that you will be on for the rest of your life. You are now born again, a new creation in the eyes of your heavenly Father. God has a wonderful plan for your life. Call this station to talk about the next steps. God bless, brother.